Hi, everyone. All right, let me know if you can hear me. Um, I changed my streaming setup a little bit, uh, so the quality might actually be a little bit reduced today, but hopefully it'll still be good enough that you can see and hear me. Uh, I have I have on order some new cables that I'm going to run across the house uh, to make sure everything is uh, more stable in the future, but they haven't arrived yet. So let me know in the chat box if you can hear me. I can see there's some folks here. And we'll start in just a minute. Hi, Raul. Good to see it's actually live. Hi, Maya. Apparently it's only grad students here today. That's cool. Grad students rock. <laughs> All the grad students are here today. <laughs> uh, nice job, grad students. <laughs> Ah, there's an undergrad. Uh, cool. Okay, so. Oh, Lily Smith is sad. Don't be sad, Lily. There's another, there's two, three undergrads, but mostly grad students are here. All right. There's another undergrad. I'm not going to actually continue to list everybody's status. That seems not educationally helpful. All right, so, uh... Uh, let's do some logic. Here's something funny. Uh, don't forget to read it. Uh, but I'm not going to explain it today, even though I know explaining jokes makes them funnier, but not today. Okay, uh, let's do some logic. So remember what we've been doing in the class is we've been trying to come up with an argument of theory validity. We've been trying to figure out how can we tell whether or not an argument is valid, uh, what makes an argument valid. Got to continue my S tier hydration. And the idea we've been working with for trying to figure out whether or not an argument is valid is by looking at the form of the argument. And so the idea is, well, maybe we can figure out whether or not an argument is valid just by looking at the form. And so we had some ways of doing that. We had our theory of truth, um, truth functional logic. And when arguments were truth functionally valid, we saw we could see that they were valid just by looking at the truth functional form of the argument. And then recently what we've been doing is first order logic. And first order logic can make sense of the validity of more arguments just using the form of their argument, uh, just using the form of that argument. Uh, so we did proofs in first order logic. Uh, and now is when I would normally say something like, let's get our proof juices flowing. But I'm not going to do it. Yeah, I'm not doing it. Uh, okay, so no proofs. We're not going to do any proofs today. Well, you might do proofs today because there's some in the homework, but I'm not going to do any proofs today. Actually, maybe I'll do some proofs in office hours. So if you need to do proofs with me, we can do proofs in office hours. Uh, but I'm not going to do a proof right now in front of you guys. Instead, I'm going to remind you that what we were talking about at the uh, in the middle of last class was how we can show that a, uh, a first order logic argument is invalid. And so we recalled that we had three ways of doing it before last class. So we had the counterexample method, which dates back to class number two. We had truth tables, and that worked for truth functional arguments. And we had the finite domain method, and we saw how to do that for first order logic arguments. Uh, that's going to be really computationally difficult because we have to check lots of domains in order to do that. And then last time, we saw a more general method, uh, which is basically the same thing the finite domain method is doing, but it's more direct. The more general method is to find a counterexample to the validity of the argument. Uh, that is, find a model that makes the premises true, but the conclusion false. And if you can find such a model, uh, then we know that there's a way of making the premises true and the conclusion false. All right, so what is a model? Uh, so remember that a model contains a domain, and that's the stuff that's in the model. Uh, and then it tells us the extension of the predicates and the relations. Uh, so if, the, if, if, there's, if there's like a property we're talking about, like is an apple or uh, x loves y, then the model has to tell us who loves whom in the model. And then the model also has to give us the reference of names. Um, and then what we saw we could do is if we had some argument, this is a funny example of an argument because it has no premises, but this is an argument from no premises to this conclusion. So in other words, this is claiming that this conclusion is a tautology. If we have an argument like that and we want to show that it's invalid, then what we have to do is we have to find a model that makes the premises true and the conclusion false. 
But since there are no premises here, all we have to do is find a model that makes the conclusion false. That's enough to show that it's not a tautology. And we did that last time. Here's a model uh, that makes uh, this sentence false. It makes this sentence false because it makes the antecedent true and the consequent false. Uh, why does it make the antecedent true? Well, the antecedent says for all x there exists a y such that f x y. And so here we see all there's three things in our model, one, two, three. And each one of these three things uh, f's somebody. That's not exactly what I meant, but you know what I mean. Let's say f. Let's say f means love somebody. So each one of the each one of the elements uh, in this model loves somebody. One loves itself, and two, and two loves three, and three loves one. Uh, so everybody loves somebody, but there does not exist a person that everybody loves. Uh, so uh, so then the consequence false. I see that nobody is laughing down in the chat box. I don't understand why because that was a hilarious gaffe. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Again. I'm really glad that all my years of watching YouTube videos is paying off now. And now I know exactly what to say. All right. Okay, so we have this model. The model shows that the conclusion here is not necessarily true. Uh, and then we have this way of writing the model, which is a visual representation of the model. Uh, uh, and then we had um, uh, this way of writing the model, which is a more abstract way of, of referencing the model. Uh, and uh, yeah, but it's the same thing. Uh, someone said down in the chat box, it was very funny, but the stream buffered at the exact moment I said it. Uh, yeah, I see that my connection is not super strong, although it seems to be improving. Although today, unlike last time, there were no drop frames. Uh, and as I mentioned, if you're just showing that, I have a plan to improve my connection, uh, although I need to um, hardwire my streaming setup into my router, uh, and those cables are on the way. Uh, I tested that yesterday, and I think that will make the connection a lot stronger. Uh, so hopefully that'll reduce some of the buffering. Okay, uh, so we had this counterexample uh, to this to the validity of this argument, the argument being from no premises to this conclusion. We had this counterexample, question mark, uh, which was just like the first model, except, hey, go away. Uh, <laughs> no, sorry. Uh, so we had this one, which is just like the one we just looked at, except for now there's a line from one to three. Instead of in the first one, there's a line from three to one. So now we have a line from one to three. Um, and so this is not a counterexample. Why is it not a counterexample? Well, because it doesn't make this sentence false. Uh, in this sentence, it's not, in this model, it's not true that everybody loves somebody. In particular, three down here doesn't love anybody. So, so it's important to be really exact about what the model is. This is not the model, this is the model. And the only difference is which way this arrow is pointing. All right. Uh, right, so that got a flaming sad face. Okay, uh, so let's do one. So here's an argument. This argument is invalid, uh, and let's find a model that makes it invalid. So the argument is there exists something that's p, and there exists something such that if it's p, then it's q, and then the conclusion is there's something that's q. And this is a really natural argument form uh, for people to sometimes say out loud uh, and, uh, and maybe even use in a formal argument. Um, but this argument form is invalid. And you should probably recall that it's invalid because you probably remember that this general form of things is funky whenever we have an existential quantifier outside of a material conditional. Uh, that gets weird. Um, so, and what we're gonna show now is that th one of the reasons why it's weird is because this argument is invalid. Okay, so how do we find a model uh, where this is invalid? Well, in order to find a model where this is invalid, we're gonna have to construct one. Um, so we're just gonna have to make one up. Uh, so, so let's start doing it. Okay, so uh, we're gonna have our model and the model's gonna have to have a domain. Uh, so domain. And you'll remember domains have to be non-empty so there has to be something in the domain. Uh, so let's put the number zero in the domain. There might be other things in the domain so I'll write the closing, <laughs> that looks like the number three. Uh, supposed to be a bracket. Well, that's an even worse bracket, but you get the idea. Uh, those are supposed to be brackets. Uh, there might be other things in the, the domain we don't know yet. Uh, what we're gonna have to do is we're gonna have to make a model that makes all the premises true and the conclusion false. Uh, so we're gonna have to put things in and take them out as necessary to make the premises true and the conclusion false. Okay, so we have to have a domain and it has to have something in it, so we put zero in it. Um, and then we have two predicates. So we have P and Q. Uh, so we're gonna have to give the extensions of P and Q. Uh, so P will have some extension. Uh, Q will have some extension. Uh, and again, we're not gonna know what's in them yet. We're gonna have to build that up. But extensions, unlike the domain, can be empty. So we'll leave those empty for a second. 
Okay, so let's make the premises true and the conclusion false. Okay, so how do we do that? Well, the first premise is there exists something that's P. Okay, so let's change the model to make that true. So right now, is there anything that's P? Well, no, because P is empty, and there's only one thing in the domain. So if we're going to make that true, we better put 0 in P. Okay, so now we have a model where the first premise is true. There exists something that's P. Uh, that's true because we have 0 in our domain and 0 is in P. So we've made the first premise true. Okay, what about the second premise? The, premise, the second premise says there exists something such that if it's P, then it's Q. Okay, well, are there any things right now in our model that are, that are such that if they're P, then they're Q? Okay, well, we have only one thing in the model so far. It's 0, and 0 is P and not Q. So 0 makes this true and this false. Okay, so right now there is, there is not a thing such that if it's P, then it's Q. So we have to make sure there is a thing such that if it's P, then it's Q. So the easiest way to do that is to add 0 to Q also. Okay, so now we have a model where the first premise is true. We have to, we have to check that because we might have made a change that messed that up. Uh, so it, it, actually, do we still have such a model? And we do, right? Because there exists something that's P, yep, uh, 0 is still P. Uh, and we also have something such that uh, if it's P, then it's Q. That's also 0 because P is uh, 0 is P and 0 is Q. Okay, so then the last thing we have to do is make sure that the model makes the conclusion false. The, the conclusion says there exists something uh, that's Q. And so we want that to be false. Oh, wait a second. How can we do that? Oh no, there is something that's Q right now. So right now that's not going to work, right? So what do we do? Any ideas? Say what down say what your idea to do might be in the yeah, you know what I'm trying to say. Say in the chat box what you think we could do here. So we have to make this false. So it can't be that there exists something that's Q. So we're definitely going to have to get rid of that zero somehow, right? So I just deleted it. How can we do that? Waiting for ideas in the chat box. Add one to each one of the sets. Okay, so let's see if we do that. So, uh, so I take it your idea is, oh, there's three sets on the screen. So what if I add the number one and I'll add one to all three of the sets? Would that work? OK, so now let's check. So does it make the first premise true? There exists something that's P. Yep. Uh, there exists something such that if it's P, then it's Q. Uh, does that work? Uh, well, the number 1 is such that if it's P, then it's Q. Uh, so this is still true. Uh, and then we need to make the conclusion false. Uh, so there exists something that's Q. That needs to be false. Oh, no, there is still something that's Q here. So that's not going to work. So we need another plan. All right, let's see what else was proposed. Uh, Something must be a P that is also not a Q. OK, but that's true right now. We've got the 0 that's not a Q and it is a P. But that doesn't make uh, the second premise true. Uh, make something neither P nor Q is one suggestion. OK, so what if we try that? So I'll add the number 1 to the domain, and it will be neither P nor Q. OK, so what's the idea there? Well, let's check. Is there some, still something that's P? Yep, that's 0. Is there something such that if it's P, then it's Q? Well, is 0 that thing? Well, no, 0 is P, and it's not Q. So 0 is not this thing. What about 1? Well, 1 is not P, and it's not Q. So then this material conditional is true of 1. So then both of the premises are true uh, in this model. And does there exist something that's Q? No, there's not anything that's Q. Q is the empty set. So yeah, OK, we did it. We found a model uh, in which the premises of this argument are true and the conclusion is false. So there you go. There's your counterexample to the validity of this model. If you have questions about that, uh, type it down in the chat box. Uh, I see that my audio is speaking. Sorry for those of you listening to this on headphones, and I might be blowing your ears out. I've been trying different streaming set setups to try to make everything really clear. Uh, OK, so question down in the chat box. Could you make p all even numbers and then q a specific even number, 2, for example? Uh, so no, we couldn't do that. Why couldn't we do that? Well, because we need our model to have uh, this be false, the conclusion be false. And the conclusion says there is something that's q. So if we put anything at all in that q box, our model's not going to be a counterexample. So no, that proposal is not going to work. Um, the general idea here uh, to get this model is that we have to have something in p. And then we have to have something that's in neither. 
Uh, so this is kind of the minimal model that will serve as a counterexample. You could add extra stuff on here, um, but uh, but this is the minimal model. Okay, so one, a question down the box is, can I explain how this makes the second premise true? Uh, yep, so I'll run through the whole thing again. So remember, what makes it a counterexample is that it makes both of the premises true and the conclusion false. Uh, so why does it make the first premise true? Well, it makes the first premise true because there is something that's p, namely the number zero. Why does it make the uh, second premise true? The second premise says there is something such that if it's p, then it's q. And so which thing is that? Well, is it the number zero? Well, no, it's not the number zero because the number zero is p and is not q. So that would be a true here and a false here. And if we have a true and then a false from interior condition, it's false. So it's not zero. What about one? Well, one is not p, and one is also not q. So false, false in a material conditional, that's true. So then there is something such that if it's p, then it's q, namely the number one, because it's not p. OK, so then that's why it makes both of the premises true, and then it makes the conclusion false because q is empty. All right, uh, could we add something to the domain and to q that is not in p or that still result in the true line in the truth table? Uh, yeah, so the answer to that is we can't have anything in Q at all, no matter what else we put anywhere else. Why can't we have anything in Q at all? Well, because we do, well, then there will exist something that's Q, so then we won't have a counterexample, because a counterexample has to be a case uh, where the conclusion is false. So if there is anything at all in Q, then we don't have a counterexample. Uh, all right. I see my internet is back to streaming at full quality, uh, so I hope, uh, I hope you can all see the fact that I'm balding really clearly. Uh, okay, uh, let's move on. All right, uh, so here's the counterexample more clearly written. Uh, so question in the chat box. So the counterexample works because there's something that's neither P nor Q, and yeah, that's exactly right. That's what makes the second premise true, and that's the kind of harder aspect to coming up with this model. Uh, so when you do the homework that's due this Friday, uh, just a reminder uh, uh, to everyone, uh, I know probably everyone, most people know this, but uh, recently I've been getting uh, an email or two where people seem a little confused. Uh, the homeworks are not due at all until as late as I can make them due, and I haven't actually given you a final de deadline yet, um, but it'll at least be May 1st, uh, maybe later. I'll, I'll have to see what the administration is going to let me do. Um, so the homework's not, nothing is actually due in this class until uh, May 1st at the very earliest. Um, and uh, But I'm giving you recommended deadlines uh, so that you can uh, keep going along and know where you should be at each point in time. So the, the homework that I recommend you try to do by this Friday um, will do a lot of hand-holding you through building counterexamples to arguments and also showing you other things you can do with models. All right. Uh, so then, uh, just to recap then, ways of proving invalidity, we have four of them, the counterexample method, truth tables for truth functional arguments, the finite domain method for first order logic arguments, and finding a counterexample more generally, which is what we just did. Uh, and so finding a counterexample, that'll work for any argument at all. Um, and it will work for first order logic arguments, uh, kind of more straightforwardly, but it's basically the same thing we did for truth functional arguments. It's not a new idea, we're just doing it more explicitly now. Okay, so we those are ways of showing that arguments are invalid on the basis of their form. Okay, so then we had, remember we had our first logic, truth functional logic, and truth functional logic looked at arguments in terms of the truth functional form of the argument. And now we have first order logic, and first order logic looks at arguments in terms of their first order form, which is just like the truth functional form, plus in first order logic, we can talk about arguments that say things like everything is this, or there exists something like this, or this is identical to this. Uh, so first order logic just allows more expressive power uh, into the logic. And so we've built this logic, and so we should ask then, is this logic a good logic? And so this is where we get to the meta stuff. Again, got to keep up that S tier hydration. I still don't remember what S tier means. Anyways, uh, okay, so uh, so is this a good logic? So uh, so remember when we were talking about truth functional logic, we had three criteria for deciding whether or not it was a good logic. We wanted it to be expressively adequate. That is, the logic could say everything we wanted to be able to say in it. So for truth functional logic, we wanted to be able to talk about any truth functional stuff. And then we showed that we could talk about any truth functional stuff. So it turned out that truth functional logic was expressively adequate. We wanted the logic to be sound. Um, and so there was a, a really good question on Piazza 
Uh, so let me, uh, uh, about what sound means here, so let me try to clarify a little bit. So we use the word sound on day one of the class uh, as one way in which an argument could be good. We talked about argument validity, deductive argument validity, and deductive argument soundness. Uh, and so there the argument was sound or not. Here this is a different thing, so same word, um, but here we're talking about the proof system, not the argument. Uh, so we're going to talk about the soundness theorem, uh, and showing that the proof system is sound. And what that means is, is this. Uh, what it means is that if there is a proof in, this, in the proof system from some premises to some conclusion, then the argument from those premises to that conclusion really is valid. So that's what it's going to mean for a proof system to be sound, is that if there's a proof in that proof system from some premises to some conclusion, then the argument really does follow. So sound means, yeah, it gets it right. If it says there's a proof, then it really does follow. Okay, uh, and then the last thing we wanted to look for was completeness. And completeness says uh, that uh, we can come up with a proof of any argument that is valid. So if we have an argument in first order logic, uh, then we'll be able to come up with a proof in our proof system that that uh, argument is valid. I see that my connection speed is dropping a little bit here. Uh, so I hope you're able to still hear and see me. Uh, it's telling me there's no drop frames because I changed to a variable bit rate. Uh, so hopefully it's going through uh, cleanly enough. Uh, but uh, I apologize if not. And again, just like last time, so I ended up watching the video through last time, and it seemed like the uh, YouTube was able to record it in good enough quality that I left it online. Uh, but again, here I'm recording it locally, so I will be able to upload the local version if the version that YouTube saves is not very good. So I'll check on that again. Okay, so uh, so we had three things. We want the logic to be expressively adequate. That is, we want it to be able to say everything we want, want it to be able to say. Um, uh, uh, some people are telling me down in the chat box that the screen is pixelated, but the audio is fine. And that's probably okay, because the screen hasn't changed in a little while here. Uh, okay, uh, it looks like the connection is improving too, so hopefully it'll get a little clearer. Okay, so we want the logic to be able to say everything we want to say. That's expressive adequacy. We want the logic to be sound, the proof system to be sound. That means if we give a proof, then the conclusion really does follow from the premises. And we want the proof system to be complete. That is, if we've got a valid argument, there's going to be a proof of it. All right. So then last time we said in order to really understand these notions, we needed to distinguish between syntactic notions uh, of arguments following and semantic notions of arguments following. Uh, so we've talked a lot about validity, and validity is a semantic notion. It's about what really does follow. Um, okay, so what does it mean for an argument to be valid? Well, it means that uh, if the premises are true, the conclusion has to be true. So that means any model of the premises is also going to be a model of the conclusion. Any way of making the premises true is going to be a, a way of making the conclusion true. Uh, so that's a semantic notion. It's about the, the models. It's about what really does follow. Um, so we're going to use the double turn style. That's this little symbol here to denote that. We're going to say P entails C, or the argument from P to C is valid. That means that every model of the premises is a model of the conclusion. Every way of making the premises true makes the conclusion true. Um, and then we've been, in class up to this point, or up to last class, uh, we've been equivocating a little bit between that and what, what we'll now call P proves C, or there's a proof from P to C. And there's uh, a proof from P to C when you can literally construct one. So in our proof system, this is a proof from these two premises to this conclusion. So this shows that these two premises prove this conclusion. And then the question we're going to ask for soundness, for example, is it, is it true that any time we have a proof like this, that P entails C? So we're going to say, is it true that any time P proves C, that P entails C? Okay, so these are subtly different notions that I was kind of letting us conflate up to this point in the class, but we've got to stop conflating them now in order to understand uh, what's going on. All right. Um, so let me say before we jump into this uh, that the uh, we're gonna I'm gonna talk about soundness and completeness and and um, expressive adequacy for first order logic. Um, but this is the part of the class where we're peeking out on the difficulty curve. Uh, so remember I said at the beginning of the class that the conceptual difficulty was gonna uh, subtly increase. Uh, until towards the end of the class, we're, well, today and maybe next class, depending on how far we get today, uh, we're going to peak out that curve. Um, so if you're not totally following, that's okay. Um, you can go back and walk the, watch the lectures again. Uh, and as you'll see today, I'm not even going to give you all the technical details of this proof. Uh, these, well, there's going to be several proofs. I'm not even going to give you all the technical details. 
Um, instead, what I'm hoping you'll do is get the intuitive idea of how this works uh, so that you can better understand how proof systems work and what a logic is. Um, if you want to understand the technical details of these things, I highly recommend you take a second class in logic. Uh, the second class in logic up until last year was called Phil 6, um, which was also Math 572. So I think we recently changed the number, but I have no idea what we changed the number to, because uh, having uh, Phil 6 be the same as a graduate level class in mathematics confused people because it's a it's a graduate level class in mathematics um, but if you're interested in in the sorts of more technical meta stuff that I'm talking about today that would be the right next step for you uh, all right so let's talk about it okay so uh, what does sound to say well as we just said several times it means that if we can make a proof for an argument in the proof system then the argument really is valid or as we'll denote it here if P proves C then P entails C so the more intuitive idea is that the proofs are right if we have a proof then that conclusion really does follow from the premises. And hopefully that's true of our proof system, because we spent a lot of time designing our proof system in really rigorous, careful ways to make sure that works. But what we're going to do here is try to prove that that actually follows. And it's going to turn out, spoiler alert, uh, that first order logic is sound. Uh, so, uh, and, and in particular, this proof system that we've given is a sound proof system. Um, but we can't just say that. We have to prove it. Okay, so let's... Uh, uh, let's prove it. The really broad idea of how this is going to work is that in order to show its sound, what we're going to do is we're going to take each one of the rules in the logic and we're going to show that it preserves validity. So if we've got validity up to a certain point in a proof, then if we use whatever rule, we're going to maintain our validity. So then we know that any argument is going to, or any proof is going to be, is going to maintain validity. Uh, so then we can conclude that every proof is going to be uh, a proof of a valid argument. Okay, that's going to be the idea, but we'll flesh that out more. In order to flesh that out more, we need a new argumentative technique. Uh, yes, Ren and Stimpy. Uh, I, that was probably only for the grad students. Uh, if you're not a grad student and you know Ren and Stimpy, raise your hand and then realize that no one can see you raising your hand and then say something in the chat box. Okay, uh, so in order to prove uh, uh, that uh, first order logic is sound, we're going to need a new technique called mathematical induction. And uh, so this is going to be an argument technique. Uh, uh, that uh, we're going to use. Um, but before we get into this, some of you have probably seen this before in maybe a math class or computer science class. It's a really standard argument technique, uh, but this will be new to some folks too. Um, uh, before we get into it though, remember at the beginning of the class, we were really careful to distinguish between inductive arguments and deductive arguments. Well, mathematical induction uh, is a really poorly named argument technique because mathematical induction is a form of deductive argument. So it's not actually an inductive argument. Uh, so, so it's like induction, except not in any way at all. It's not, it's not induction. Uh, so mathematical inductive arguments are deductive arguments. Uh, and we'll see how that works in a second. All right. So let's start with an example. So let's say that you and I are opening a competing post office. Uh, we, we thought, you know, United States Post Office, that's cool and all, but we could do it better. Um, OK, so you and I are uh, opening our own post office. Uh, and uh, and a shockingly large number of the undergraduates do know Ren and Stimpy. All right. Uh, is that like a hipster thing? I can see that being a hipster thing. Uh, anyways, okay. So you and I are opening a post office, um, and we want to uh, make the postage that we sell at our postage office uh, as simple as possible. Um, but we also want to be able to charge people an arbitrary number of cents uh, for whatever they're sending. Maybe we have a really ingenious way of uh, pricing postage so that it makes that so that it overall increases efficiency or whatever. I don't know. Wharton people can talk to you about that. Okay, uh, so here is what we know. We know that we're going to charge everybody at least eight cents. That's going to be the minimum charge for any kind of postage. Uh, but we want to be able to charge any postage eight cents or larger. Um, and I want to convince you, oh, okay, well, if we want to do that, then we only need three cent stamps and five cent stamps. We don't need any other numbers of cents of stamps. Uh, so in order to create postage that's eight cents or larger, no matter what cent we're looking for, uh, all we need is three cent stamps and five cent stamps. So I want to prove to you. To, I want to prove that to you. Okay. So how might I prove it to you? Well, one really natural way for me to do it is to kind of just show you a bunch of examples. So like, oh, well, look, if we wanted to charge eight cents to somebody, well, then that's going to be one three cent stamp and one five cent stamp. So it works for eight. What if we want to charge nine cents to somebody? Well, if we want to charge nine cents to somebody, that's going to be three cents and three cents and three cents. Uh, what if we want to do 10? Well, if we want to do 10, that's going to be 5 and 5. And what about 11? Well, that's 5 and 3 and 3. And what about 12? Well, that's 3 and 3 and 3 and 3. Uh, so we could do this, but the question we're going to ask here and the, and 
spoiler alert, there's an answer, uh, which is how can we generalize this? Is there a way to show that this works for any number of sets? And the answer is going to be yes. So that's what we're going to do. Okay, so we're going to define up this new predicate, p of n. So p is true of some number n when n cents postage can be made using 3 cent and 5 cent stamps. So we want to show that p of n is true of every n 8 and larger. And we just showed it for 8 through 12, but we'll, now we want to show it for all integers larger than 8. Uh, okay, so p of n means n can be uh, made, n cents can be made using 3 cents and 5 cent stamps combined. And so as I just said, what we want to show is that p of k is true, uh, sorry, that's, I didn't just say this, I'm saying this now. Um, the way we're going to do this is we're going to show that if p of k is true for some number k, then p of k plus 1 is going to be true. Uh, and I'll explain more why we're going to do this in a minute, but that's what we're going to do. We're going to show that if, if p is true of some number k, then it's also going to be true of k plus 1. Um, and then the way the intuitive, uh, so don't read that part yet, but the, the, the intuitive way that this is going to work is we're going to show, well, it works for 8, and then we're going to show that if it works for some random number, 8 or larger, then it works for the next number. And so if both of those things are true, it works for 8, and if it works for 8, then it works for the next, uh, sorry, if it works for 8, <laughs> let me try that again. Uh, we're going to show that it works for 8, and then we're going to show that if it works for some number 8 or larger, then it works for the next number, then we're going to be able to conclude it works for every number. Okay, so we're going to do that. And when we're going to do that, there's going to be two cases that we have to look at. Uh, there's going to be the cases where the coins uh, in the k number of stamps contain a five cent piece. And there's going to be the um, uh, case where the coins don't contain a five cent piece. So we'll do this out visually and that'll probably make a little more sense. Okay, so let's look at the first case. So let's assume uh, we've got some number of k cents and we want to show that uh, we uh, made up of threes and fives. And we want to show that uh, we can uh, make up the next number of cents using threes and fives. And let's suppose we've got a case where the k contains a five cent piece. Uh, so what we're looking at here is, here are the cents that we have, here's k cents for some random number k, we don't know what it is, we know it's eight or larger, uh, but we know that there's a five cent in, in there. Well, if there's a five cent piece in there, then we can take the five cent piece out and replace it by two three cents coins, and then we get k plus one cents. Right, so if we have k cents, and there's a five cent uh, stamp in there, then we can take out the five cent uh, stamp, I should have said stamp here, not coin. We can take out the five cent stamp and replace it with two three cent stamps. So we take out five and replace it with two threes, that is six. So then we get k plus one cents. Okay, so this shows that if we have k cents, uh, where k is eight or larger, and there is a five cent piece in there, then we can make k plus one cents by taking out the five and putting in two fives, uh, putting in two threes. Okay, well, what about case two? Case two is where there's no five cent piece in here. So here we assumed that when we had k cents, there was five cent piece in there. Uh, but what about when there's no five cent piece? Well, if there's no five cent piece and the number is eight or larger, then there has to be at least three threes. Why is that? So let's think about that for a second. So if the number is at least eight or larger, well, if it's eight and there's no five cent pieces in there, well, that's actually going to be impossible, right? Because there's no way to get eight cents without five cent pieces uh, if you're only using fives and threes. So then if it's larger than eight and it doesn't contain a five, well then it must be divisible by three. But if it's larger than eight and divisible by three, it's gotta be nine or higher. And then nine divided by three is three. So there's gotta be at least three three cent stamps in here if we've got a case where we have k cents and there's no five cent stamp in there and we know k is eight or larger. So we know there's gonna be three three cent stamps in here. So we can take out those three three cent stamps and replace them with two five cent stamps. So we take out 3 times 3, that is 9, and replace them with 5 times 2, that is 10. So we take out 9 from here and put in 10, and now we have k plus 1 cents again. Okay, so what was the general idea? The general idea is we were trying to show that no matter what k was, as long as it was, as long as it was 8 cents or larger, then we can make k plus 1 stamp, uh, cents only using 3 cent and 5 cent stamps. And how did we do that? Well, we showed that if, there, if we do have k cents, uh, and uh, made of three cent and five cent uh, stamps, uh, then it's either got to contain a five cent piece or not contain a five cent piece. If it does contain a five cent piece, then we can take out the five and replace it with two threes and we get k plus one. If it doesn't contain a five, well then it's got to have three threes, so we can take out those three threes and replace it with two fives and then again we get k plus one cents. So either way we know that if we have k cents, we can make k plus one cents just using three cent and five cent pieces. Okay, so that shows us that we can 
do it for any number. Well, why is that? Well, there's this general idea of the mathematical induction argument uh, that's kind of a domino effect sort of thing. Uh, so uh, let's think about how dominoes work. Uh, well, uh, let p of n be the nth domino falls over. Well, what do we have to do then to show that all of the dominoes are going to fall over? Well, we have to show that the first domino sh falls over. So that is, we have to show that uh, we can make eight cents of uh, stamps out of three and five cent stamps. And that's pretty easy. It's three plus five. Um, and then we have to show that if p of k is true, if the kth domino falls over, then the kth plus one domino falls over. k plus one, whatever. I don't know how to formulate, but you know what I'm trying to say. If the kth one falls over, then so does the next one. And so if we show that the first one falls over, and, and we also show that if some random one, the first one or after that falls over, then so does the next one, then we can conclude that for every n, n falls over. So every domino is going to fall over. So that's the way mathematical induction works. So in the, cent ex in the stamp example, we showed um, that uh, uh, our base case was 8. Uh, and there we show that you can make 8 uh, cents out of 3 cents and 5 cents. And then we showed if you've got some random number k, uh, made of three cents and five cents, then we can make k plus one also made of three cents and five cents. Uh, so then we can conclude that for any number of cents, eight or larger, uh, we can make that number of cents using three cent and five cent uh, pieces. All right, so that's how mathematical induction works. Uh, let me uh, formalize this a little bit more. So we let pn be a predicate defined on the integers. So n is just going to be some number, p of n is going to, is going to be a predicate. So, we've, so predicate defined on integers, that sounds fancy. It's not really. We've talked, you know, so evenness is a predicate that's defined on the integers, right? It's not true of all the numbers. It's only true of half of them in some intuitive sense. Um, uh, but, you know, that just means a property of the, even, of the numbers. Okay, so let p of n be a property of numbers. And then we have, if the basis step is true, that is, p a is true for some fixed a, and we also know that the inductive step is true, that is, uh, for all integers k that are larger than or equal to a, if p of k is true, then p of k plus 1 is true. So that's called the inductive step. Uh, and so that says, so we've got in our basis step that p a is true, and then we know, well, okay, if we've got some k that's equal to or uh, greater than a, if p of k is true, then p of k plus 1 is true. So if both of those things are true, the basis step and the inductive step, we can conclude that for all integers n that are greater than or equal to a, p of n is true. Okay, so that's a technical definition of mathematical induction. Uh, that's how mathematical induction works. Uh, if you have questions about mathematical induction, like is it induction? Well, the answer is no, it's deduction, because you can see here that if these two premises follow, or sorry, if these two premises are true, the basis step and the inductive step, well then the conclusion does necessarily follow, right? Uh, the premise, premise one is p of a is true for some fixed a. Uh, premise two is that uh, for all integers k that are larger than or equal to a, if p of k, then p of k plus one. If those two premises are true, well then the conclusion that is true of all integers necessarily follows. So mathematical induction is actually a form of deduction. Uh, and we're going to use that form of deduction in one second uh, to prove that first order logic is sound. All right. So let's do it. Who's excited? I can't see you, so this just feels super awkward. I assume you're excited. All right. Young Ben's excited. Okay, uh, all right, uh, man, this is a really weird semester. Okay, so let's prove soundness. So remember, soundness says that if P proves C, that is, there's a proof from P to C, then P entails C. And we want to show, that, show that's true for any P and C. Okay, so here's how it's going to work. So the, 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 the kind of key idea to the soundness proof is that any proof is going to be of a finite length. If we have a proof, well, then there's a certain number of steps in the proof, right? You can't have a proof that goes on infinitely long. Uh, I could give you one of those on Carnap, but it would take you forever. That was a hilarious joke that wasn't technically accurate, as you would know if you took calculus. But anyways, that's not the point. Okay, so uh, in fact, all first order proofs have a finite length. Um, uh, uh, so, uh, in fact, all first order proofs have a finite length, and what we're going to do is we're going to do induction on the length of the proof. Before I do that, I see a question in the chat box here. Uh, so a question in the chat box says, um, how does showing that p of 9 is true show that uh, p of k plus 1 is true? Uh, and so the answer is that it doesn't. Um, so let me scroll back to that, what I think you're referring to. So I, I take it you're thinking about this case down here. Uh, so how can we, how does... Uh, what's going on in this proof? So what's going on in this proof is we said, suppose that p of k is true for some k, 
and we don't know what k is. We just know that it's eight or larger. Uh, so we're not assuming it's nine. Um, uh, so we're not assuming that the k we're talking about is nine. Um, we're just assuming that it's eight or larger. Well, then k, the k sense that we have either contains a five cent piece or it doesn't contain a five cent piece. So these are supposed to be two cases. Uh, okay, so then if it does contain a five cent piece, well then we can get k plus one cents like this by taking out the five and replacing it with two threes. And if it doesn't contain a five cent piece, well then we know that it has to contain at least nine made by three threes. Um, it has to contain at least nine. Uh, we're not saying that it is nine, but it has to be at least nine. That's why there's some other coins here. Um, okay, so there, it is at least nine. Uh, so then we can take out those three cent, uh, those three three cents, and replace them by two fives. Uh, so then we can get k plus one also. So the general point of this slide is showing that if we've got some k number of cents uh, that um, is eight or larger, uh, then and it's made of threes and fives, uh, then we can, no matter what the number is, we can make k plus one cents also made of threes and fives. And the way we showed that is by looking at two separate cases. Uh, so so we never assumed it was actually nine anywhere. Uh, in the second case, we assumed that it was going to be at least nine, but we can know that because uh, if it doesn't contain a five and it's at least three, well then it has to be nine because you can't get eight with at least three, uh, with uh, three threes. Uh, sorry, you can't get eight without, uh, sorry, I said that wrong. We know that the number is at least eight cents. Uh, so if it doesn't contain a five, then it has to be at least nine. Right, because if it doesn't contain a five and it's made out of threes and fives, uh, and it's at least eight, well then it's got to be nine or larger. Okay. All right. Okay. So proving soundness. Uh, let's prove it. Okay. So uh, all proofs are going to be finite length. So what we're going to do is we're going to do a mathematical induction on the length of the proof. Okay. So then, what's our base case going to be? Uh, our base case is going to be we're going to uh, try to show that. Uh, for proofs of length one, and we're going to have to say really specifically what it means to be a proof of length one. For proofs of length one, if p proves c, then p entails c. And then we're going to show in, the, in our inductive step that we're going to assume it works for uh, proofs up to length k. And then we're going to show that for proofs of length k plus one, if p proves c, then p uh, entails c. All right, so that's the idea. Uh, we're going to show that it works for proofs of length one. Uh, and then we're going to show that if, so, if it works, works for proofs of some arbitrary length k, then it also works for uh, proofs of k plus 1. And then we'll be able to conclude that it works for proofs of any length. But since any proof that we have must have some length, uh, since we've shown it works for proofs of any length, it must work for every proof. So that's how we're going to show that no matter what the proof is, if p proves c, then p entails c. Okay, well, let's talk about the base case for a second. So how's it going to work in the base case? So what does it mean for a proof to be length 1? Well, here we're just going to have to make a stipulative definition. And we're going to say a proof is of length 1 when you've written down the premises. And we're going to just stipulate that the conclusion is the last premise. And if you go back and think about our definition of proof, that's a super weird proof. But it could, I mean, when did we say a proof is done? Well, the proof is done when you have the conclusion on the last line, and every line that needs your justification has one. right? So a proof where you just write down the premises, uh, like this one. So here we've got our main line. Uh, we've got our premise p, uh, and then we stop. Well, so that's a proof from p to p, All right? Uh, every line that needs justification has one. We've got our conclusion on the main line, not in any subproofs. Okay, so that's that's what we're going to think of as our paradigm length of uh, our paradigm example of a proof of length one. If you don't like that, there's ways of doing it where we don't assume that. Uh, it's just going to make it a little bit more complicated. Um, okay, so then we have to check to make sure that soundness is true. Oops, I didn't mean to underline that. Uh, we need to check to make sure that soundness is true of proofs of length one. Uh, well, so is it true of proofs of length one that if p proves c, then p entails c? Well, here's our proof of length one. Uh, so is it true in this proof that uh, if p proves c, so p and c are the same here, so if p proves p, which it does, um, does p entail c? Well, does p entail p? Yes, p does entail p. How do we know that? Well, because any model that makes p true is going to have to make p true. And what does it mean for p to entail c? Well, it means that any model that makes p true has to make c true. But since p and c are both p here, uh, we know that any model that makes p true also makes p true. So then that's why the induct that's why the base case works. We know that for any proof of length one, that is where the last premise is our conclusion, uh, the uh, uh, soundness is going to hold. Okay, so then the hard part of the proof is showing the inductive step. 
the inductive step. Um, so the way it works in the inductive step is we assume we've got some proof going and it's of length k, and now we're gonna uh, and we and we know that soundness works for that. We know that if that's a proof of c, then p entails c. The premises entail what we've got on on the last line. And then we want to show if we've got a proof like that, um, then uh, if we make a proof that's one step longer, uh, it's still going to work. That if that's a proof of uh, something on the last line, then uh, the premises are still going to entail that thing on the last line. Okay, so how does that work? Okay, uh, well, uh, we talked about the base case already, but the base case says proofs of length one or where the conclusion is one of the premises, so then it's obviously going to follow the p and tail c. How does the inductive step work? Well, the, in the inductive step, as I was just saying, we assume that it works for proofs of up to length k, and then we want to show that it works for uh, proofs of length k plus one. And how does this work? Well, if you've got a proof and it's got k plus one lines in it, well, you must have gotten it by applying a rule uh, to a proof of length k. And by rule, I mean one of our proof rules or uh, starting a subproof. But notice that if you started a subproof, then it's not going to be a, a, a situation where p proves c, right? Because you won't be back on the main line. So we actually don't need to worry about proofs that get longer by starting subproofs. Uh, we only need to worry about proofs that get longer by using a rule. Okay, so if the proof is a proof of length k plus 1, uh, then uh, we know that it got longer than the proof of length k by using a rule. So then what we need to show is no matter which rule we used, it was going to preserve validity. We know that the argument to the thing on the second to last line was valid, and now we need to show uh, that the argument to the thing on the new last line is valid. And how do we do that? Well, we just look at all the rules, and we're going to, and in order to do this technically, and we're not going to do it technically, we're just going to gesture at the proof. In order to do this technically, we'd have to show that this works for every single rule. Um, we're not going to do that. Um, instead, I'm going to give you the idea of some basic rules, and then we'll move on. Um, but we would look at every single rule and say, okay, well, if we use that rule uh, to make the proof longer, would validity have been preserved? Okay, so let's look at it for conjunction introduction, the, the proof rule on the top left here. Conjunction introduction says if we've got A on some line up above in those K lines, and we've got B up above in those K lines, then we can write A and B on the new Kth plus 1 line. K plus 1? Whatever, the last the line we're adding on. Um, okay, so we know that A is up there somewhere, we know that B is up there somewhere, and we're going to write A and B on our new line. And we want to show that, um, that, that the premises are going to entail A and B, that all the models of the premises are also going to be models of A and B. Well, how do we know that's going to be true? Well, we know from our inductive assumption, that is our assumption that it works for proofs, proofs up to length K, that the premises are going to show that A, that, uh, A is entailed. Right? Because A is up there in, in a proof of length less than uh, k plus 1. And we also know that the premises are going to entail B. Why? Well, because B is up there in, in, a, in a proof of length uh, less than k plus 1. Uh, so we've already intuitive, you know, the intuitive idea is we would have already shown it for A and B that the premises entail A and B. Okay, so the premises entail A, the premises entail B, and now we want to show that the premises entail A and B, the conjunction. Well, that's pretty intuitively obvious, right? How do we show that? Well, we show that any model that's both a model of A and a model of B is a model of A and B. And what makes that true? Well, what makes that true is just the semantic definition of the conjunction. That's just what conjunction means. Conjunction is the sort of thing that's true just in case each one of the conjuncts is true. Um, so then if a model uh, makes A true and it makes B true, well, then we know it has to make the conjunction A and B true because that's just what A and B means. Okay, so that's the idea of how the proof would work. We'd show that if we've got a proof of up, up to length k, uh, where we know that the argument from the premises uh, to the thing on line k follows and every previous line, uh, then we can show that uh, the proof of length k plus 1 is also going to be a valid argument from the premises uh, by doing that general idea. We show, oh, well, if it satisfies all the, if it's valid up, uh, up until the, uh, right before the last line, well, then it's going to have to make this all the models are going to have to make this true, and all the models are going to have to make this true. All the models of the premises, I mean. Um, so then we're going to be able to conclude that it makes that the models make this true as well. And that general idea works for every proof rule. Let's think about um, conjunction elimination. Same general idea. If we've got a proof of length k plus 1 and it ends in a conjunction elimination, well, then we know that all the models of the premises make a and b true. Uh, because that was uh, the antecedent of our inductive assumption, because that's, there's a proof of length less than k plus 1 to that. Um, so then all the models make a and b true. Well, if all the models make a and b true, they also have to make a true. 
right? So that's how we know that if we made our k plus one length proof by doing conjunction elimination, that uh, all the models of the premises are going to be models of A, because we already know that they're models of A, a and B, uh, because uh, that's a proof of length uh, less than k plus one. So then on our k plus one line, we know all the models are going to make that uh, sentence true too, uh, because they make A and B true. And if you make A and B true, you've got to make A true. Reiteration, same simple idea. Uh, if we've got A on some line prior to the k plus one line, well then uh, the models are still gonna make A true, right? Uh, yeah, okay, so that's the basic idea. Uh, you know, this works for uh, disjunction elimination. If we know that all the models uh, work for the, dis uh, sorry, biconditional elimination. If we know that all the models make the biconditional A if and, if, if and only if B, true, and they also make A true, well then we know that all the models have to make B true. Okay, so the other rules, they get a little bit more complicated, but that's the intuitive idea. So what we're doing here is we're showing uh, the inductive, uh, sorry, we're showing the inductive step is true by assuming that it works for proofs of up to length K, and then showing that it works for uh, proofs of up to length uh, K plus one, and the idea is, well, if we've got a proof of length K plus one, it must have been formed by taking a proof of length K uh, and adding onto it. Uh, so then we show that any models of the uh, uh, that make all the previous stuff true are also going to have to make the new thing true, and that's exactly what the rules preserve. Uh, so that's so that's how it works. Okay, so that wasn't technically a proof. There are some uh, complicated things that we need to deal with if we wanted to make that technically a, a really airtight mathematical proof. Um, but that's the intuitive idea of how we prove soundness. If you want to see a technical proof of this, uh, you should take the next class in logic. Uh, or uh, read the logic textbooks, or just ask me how to do it. Um, I can uh, I can show you how to do it. Uh, I can also show you a little plastic bulldog, but that's not exactly relevant to the class. I see that it's overexposed. Uh, yeah, plastic bulldog. Okay, uh, but that's not part of the class. Uh, the soundness thing is part of the class. Um, uh, I see there's a question there that was um, uh, about some older stuff. Um, it was That's uh, not even stuff we talked about today, I think. Uh, so why don't we talk about it in office hours or uh, in Piazza or over email uh, rather than jumping so far back. Um, okay, so, so that's the idea of how the soundness proof works. Uh, maybe let's start getting into how completeness works. I'm not sure we'll get through it today, uh, but uh, if not, we'll do it next time. Okay, so um, first order logic is sound. You've now been convinced, even though you haven't been given a uh, proof, but it's close to a proof. Okay, so what, what does completeness say? Well, completeness says that if an argument is valid in first order logic, then we can prove it. So that is, if P entails C, then there is a proof of it. So completeness is like the flip of soundness, right? Soundness says if there is a proof, then the argument really is valid. Completeness says if the argument's valid, then there is a proof. We can figure out a proof. All right. Well, good news. First order logic is complete. Uh, no more Ren and, Ren and Stimpy, not exactly anyways. Here we have Kurt Gödel and his friend Einstein. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, Gödel proved this in his PhD dissertation. There you go, grad students, step it up a little bit. Uh, okay, uh, so uh, first order logic is complete. Uh, and let me give you the idea of how we prove that. It's not using mathematical induction, it's a totally different thing. Okay, so here's the basic idea, and I'm going to tell you the basic idea, but the basic idea should strike you as not at all related, and I'm going to show you how it re relates. Okay, so the basic idea of proving that first order logic is complete is we're going to prove that every consistent set is satisfiable. Every consistent set of first order lo uh, logic sentences, if we've got a set of first, uh, if we've got a set of sentences in first order logic, if it's consistent, then it's satisfiable. What does consistent mean? Well, consistent means that it doesn't prove a contradiction. And so here I really importantly mean it doesn't prove a contradiction. That is, there's no possible way uh, to make a proof from those premises to a contradiction. Okay, so if we've got a set that's consistent in that it doesn't prove a contradiction, then it's satisfiable. What does satisfiable mean? That means there's a model of it. Okay, so what I'm going to convince you of in a second is that if we can prove this, that every consistent set is satisfiable, if we can prove that every consistent set is satisfiable, well, that's going to entail completeness. That's really not obvious, so if you're not seeing how they're related, that is totally okay. That's what we're going to talk about in just a second. But that's the idea. What we're going to do is we're going to prove that every consistent... Well, we're not actually going to prove it. I'm going to give you the idea of how it's proved. Uh, I'm, we're going to show that it's provable that every consistent set is satisfiable. Uh, 
uh, we're going to show that every consistent set is satisfiable, which means that if we've got a set that doesn't prove a contradiction, uh, then there's a way to make a model of all the sentences in that set. Okay, so why is that going to be the thing we're, we're going to prove? Okay, well, here's, the, here's how that connects up with the completeness. So completeness says that if the argument from P to C is valid, then P proves C. So if, the, if the, all the models of P are models of C, then there's a proof that is the syntactic thing that starts out with premises P and gets the conclusion C. So that's going to be equivalent to this claim. And this step is a little bit uh, not transparent, so let's think about it a little bit. Uh, so this, so completeness is equivalent to this claim. If the set that contains P and not C, so we take P, which was already a set of sentences, and we add into that set not C, so that's the union symbol, so P union not C. Uh, so we take the set of sentences that were in P and we, and we union it with not C. So we make the set that contains P and not C. Uh, and if that set is unsatisfiable, then P union not C is inconsistent. So why is that the same claim? It's really not obvious why that's the same claim. Well, here's why. P and tail C means that every model of P is a model of C. So if P and tail C, then we know that every model that makes P true also makes C true. So if a model makes C true, then it's got to make not C not true. right? So if we take P and we can join it with not C, then we should get an unsatisfiable set. Right, so that shows that if P and tail C, then the set that contains P and not C is unsatisfiable. Okay, what about the flip direction? Well, if P and not C is unsatisfiable, then P and tail C. Well, if P and not C is unsatisfiable, then we know there's no models of P and not C. And so there's two possible ways that could happen. One way that could happen is that all the models that are models of P make C true, so then they make not C false. And if that's true, then P and tail C. Well, another way it could happen is that there are no models of P. If there are no models of P, then there's no models of P and not C. But if there are no models of P, well, then P still entails C uh, be trivially, right? Because there are no models of P, so then all the models of P make C true. In other words, P is a contradiction. OK, so then, so then P union not C is unsatisfiable. That's just equivalent to P entails C. All right, so that's why, this, that's why the antecedent of this conditional is the same as the antecedent of this conditional. Okay, what about the consequent? Well, P proves C. P proves C is, is the same as uh, P union not C is inconsistent. What does that mean? P union not C is inconsistent when it proves a contradiction. Um, well, if P proves C, uh, then, so if, if, we can, if there is a proof from P to C, then if we take P and conjoin it with not, or you know, add in not C, well, then it obviously does prove a contradiction. Uh, right? Because P proves C, and so then not C proves not C, so then P and not C is going to prove C and not C. Okay, so that's why uh, P proves C entails P union not C is inconsistent. What about the flip direction to show that these two things are, in, are equivalent? Okay, well, if P union not C is inconsistent, uh, that means this does prove a contradiction, uh, right? Uh, so P union not C does prove a contradiction. Um, but if this proves a contradiction, then it can prove C, right, by the, uh, um, the by explosion. Uh, actually, wait, that didn't follow. Uh, so, because we need to show that P proves C. Okay, so if P union not C is inconsistent, then we, it, it, sorry, it's the same move as before. So then we know that either P proves C, and then the contradiction was with not C, uh, and if P proves C, then the contradiction is with not C, well, that's going to be one case where it works. Uh, the other way that P union not C could be inconsistent is that P itself could be inconsistent, but if P itself is inconsistent, then P proves C. So either way, uh, if P proves C and is consistent, uh, then P proves C. Uh, and if P itself is inconsistent, then P is pr still going to prove C. OK, so what that long argument shows is that this conditional completeness is equivalent to this conditional. Uh, and then if we take the contrapositive of this conditional, we get if P union not C is consistent, then P union not C is satisfiable. And so remember the contrapositive, that's where we, if P then Q, the contrapositive of that is if not Q, then not P. And remember, we've proved that those are, cons are uh, equivalent. Uh, so that's what we've done here. So we've, now we've taken the contrapositive of this sentence, and we get this. If P union not C is consistent, then P union not C is satisfiable. OK, so we know that this bottom sentence is equivalent to completeness. Uh, so if we generalize this bottom sentence, 
P union Nazi, if P union Nazi is consistent, then P union Nazi is satisfiable. If we generalize that to all sentences, then we get the more general claim that every consistent set is satisfiable. So if we prove that every consistent set is satisfiable, that will entail that uh, for any P and C, P union, if P union Nazi is consistent, then P union Nazi is satisfiable. So that's why we're going to prove that every consistent set is satisfiable. Next time I'll talk to you about how we prove that every consistent set is satisfiable. Uh, but the point of this slide was just to prove you that that will prove to you that that will entail completeness. Okay, uh, so we'll do that next time. Uh, I have office hours now. I need probably five minutes uh, to switch over to that. Uh, but switch into the Zoom session uh, in just a minute if you want to come to my office hours. Um, Otherwise, I'll see you next week. Don't forget that the TAs have lots of office hours and recitations uh, throughout all times of day uh, later in the week. Uh, so feel free to go to those uh, and do the homework and uh, use Piazza. You guys have been great on Piazza, so keep using that. Uh, and I hope you're all doing well. I'll see you later. Bye, guys.